Hi guys, Freddy here. Welcome back to the desktop for another rules breakdown. And this week I'm going to be covering Unknown Armies. Now this is the 2002 second edition. Now I don't have the first edition or the third edition rules. So I don't know how much is different, although I understand they're fairly compatible. So you would need to check with the rule books to see whether this rules breakdown actually covers you through those editions. Now as usual, I like using an NPC or a pre-generated character as an example in these. So on page 325, towards the back of the book, we have some NPCs for one of the sample adventures. Now, I think I'll use Bill Toshir, Divided Man, although I'm tempted to use Don Lewis, Legal Arms Dealer and Child Molester, or even Satchel Fair, Apocalyptic Psychopath. But the first one on the page will be the easiest, so that's going to be my sample NPC for this rules breakdown. So, there are basically three types of skill roles in Unknown Armies, and they're dealt with on page 7. The page 7 is actually a very good summary of the rules. Now, there are minor skill checks. In relaxed situations where you have plenty of time and are not at risk, you automatically succeed in any skill you have 15% or higher. Game Master may ask you to roll anyway to see how long it takes, or how good a job you do. If you do not have a suitable skill, you may attempt a minor skill check, by rolling against appropriate stat in D instead, to barely squeak by a task. For this, your stat is reduced by 30. So, having a look at the character, let's say we're doing streetwise. He has a 40% chance of success, but if he didn't have it, he'd be using his mind at minus 30, so he'd have a 20% chance of success to barely squeak past. The significant skill checks in situations where there's uncertainty but little actual risk, you succeed strongly if you roll equal to or under your skill level. And you succeed weakly if you roll under your skill level but equal to or under your related stat level. If you do not have a suitable skill, you may attempt a significant skill check by rolling against the appropriate stat instead for a weak success. For this roll, your stat is reduced by 30. So for a significant skill check, he'd be rolling against the 40, but if he got between 40 and 50, he'd get weak success. He'd get strong success if he rolled under 40. And the final type, major skill checks. In tense situations where time is important to your risk, such as combat, you only succeed if you roll equal to or under the skill level. If you do not have a suitable skill, you may attempt a major skill check by rolling against the appropriate stat instead and hoping for a Hail Mary, where only ma matched successes and criticals succeed your stat is not reduced for a Hail Mary roll. So, matched rolls are when you roll the dice and you get a double, and critical rolls are where you roll 0, 1, because you're trying to roll low. So if you roll a 0, 1, it's a critical roll, a critical success, and matched rolls are double 1s, double 2s, double 3s, double 4s, etc. on up, under your skill. Also worth mentioning is fumbles. Because you're trying to roll low, if you roll the highest, so a double zero, it's a fumble roll. You fail even if you somehow have a skill or trait at 100%, rolling a double zero is still a fumble. There's flip-flop rolls, so where you roll the dice, but you can count either one as the tens and either one as the ones, because you're rolling percentile dice. So if we roll that, in a flip-flop one, we'd have 46 or 64 depending on which one we wanted. And shifted rolls are where you change your percentage. So if you've got a skill of 50% and you've got a plus 20, then you're rolling against 70%. Anyway, in this example, we roll the streetwise. So let's roll against that. Now we rolled 65. So that's a fail, even on the very easy ones, where we'll be trying to roll between the streetwise and the mine. Now, initiative is dealt with on page 48, and it explains how you roll your initiative, or you can use your default initiative. So let's have a look at the character sheet. Now, you can use your speed, and you can roll under it. So we roll our dice, and we get 90. So we have failed that. Or we can decide to use our initiative as 23 as our success. Now, the way it works is you work from high to low, for those who succeeded in rolling under their speed. 
or for their just using their default initiative. And those who rolled and failed then go high to low afterwards. So somebody who rolled higher but failed the roll goes after somebody who rolled lower but succeeded the roll. So it's high to low for successes, high to low for fails. Now normally everybody just gets one attack around, but you can split your skill. So this character has a firearms of 35%. They can shoot twice by splitting their skill into, let's say, 20% and 15%, or 30% and 5%, any way they want to split their skill. But it must also be borne in mind that the maximum your skill is, is also the maximum you can roll and do damage. Because when you're rolling to hit, you're also rolling your damage at the same time. So if you've only got a 5% chance of hitting, you're only going to be doing 5 points of damage maximum. Now for combat, you obviously use your combat skills. So this character has a firearms of 35%. So we're trying to roll under 35% to hit. And we're all 14, so we've succeeded. Now that can be slightly different because if we go to the section which deals with combat on page 48, we can see that it deals heavily with shifts. Now these are pluses and minuses to your skill. So things like you've been blinded is minus 30%. You're underwater, or at least up to the waist, is minus 10%. You're falling in free fall, minus 10%. Your opponent's barefoot or broken glass, that's 10% to your skill. Opponent has a big, heavy, off-balance frame backpack, but it's plus 10%. Your opponent's in leg irons and handcuffs is plus 30%. So you can get bonuses to your skill. But dodging works slightly differently in this game to many. When you dodge, your dodge only counts after your action. So, when it's your turn during a round, declare that you're using your dodge. So up until then, anybody attacking you, you don't get your dodge against. For the rest of that round, you have some protection against attacks. Attacks made against you before that aren't affected by dodging, they're just plain faster than you. When someone successfully attacks you while you're dodging, two things happen. You make a dodge skill check, with a minimum roll equal to your opponent's attack roll. If you succeed, the attack does no damage at all. You fail, but your opponent's attack roll is lower than your dodge skill rating. The attack does half damage round up. So, in the character here, we've got 15% dodge. So, automatically, they would be doing half damage. But if you rolled your dodge and you got even lower than that, you succeeded, you would avoid the damage completely. But when it comes to the next round, if you continue dodging, you announce it, and you do get to dodge against attacks faster than you. However, if you're swapping to doing attacks, then your dodge ceases at the end of the first round. Now, damage is based on what you rolled. So that's why I've kept the dice here. I didn't roll for my dodge there. Because the 14 is how much damage you've done as well. So the higher you roll, but under your skill the more damage you do during combat. So higher skills can lead to higher damage, but it's still all random. Now the 14 points of damage is done to the target automatically or halved if they succeeded in their dodge or failed in their dodge, but their dodge skill was still higher than the roll, which in our case it would be. But damage is also capped out at the maximum damage of the weapon. So, if you're firing a 22 long, the maximum damage you can do is 30. Um, a 9mm Akarov, 50. 17.2mm uh, Soviet, 170. So your damage is maxed out by the weapon you're using as well. But, basically, it's just the dice roll you make. Now, health is dealt with in the game through wound points. And these are the same as your body attribute. So, this character has a body of 55, he's scrawny, which means he also has 55 wound points, which are basically the same as hit points. So, 14 points of damage he's taken, he loses 14 off his 55. But the effects of those are further, and those are dealt with on page 58. When you've lost somewhere between a quarter and a third of your wound points, the GM tells you that you now have a minus 10% shift to all your stats for stat check purposes. 
Exactly when this penalty kicks in is up to the GM. If you get hurt so badly that your wound points are down to somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of your total, the GM tells you you're now at minus 20% to your stats. The first penalty is a warning that you need to get off the streets. Second penalty is a warning you're about to die. Now, those can be healed back through sort of first aid. There's healing ma minor injuries, healing major injuries. There's time of convalescence. And there's permanent damage. If you take 50 wound points or more of, in damage from a single attack and survive, you're a stud and you should feel good about yourself. However, you also survive damage that would kill many people and you never fully recover. A hit that bad marks you for life and there's no way to avoid it. The nature of the loss is up to your GM, although your group may make suggestions. It could be a straight permanent loss of wound points, between 5 and 10 is a good number, could lose points in a relevant skill, or even a stat, body and speed are obvious choices. But mind is also appropriate for cranial traumas. You may lose limbs. So, you receive wounds in massive damage, you may be permanently wounded, but usually you heal them back. But during combat, you'll be getting penalties as you rack up the damage. And advancement is dealt with on page 45. You gain experience points and you spend them. Raising a skill costs one point per point. Raising a stat by one costs two experience. However, you can't spend more than three XP on a single skill or more than two XP on a single stat in a single session. You can improve multiple skills and stats, however. The only exception to this is new skills. Buying a new skill costs 10 experience points. It starts out at 10%. Your GM may decide that you need a teacher or special training to gain a new skill. If you want to fly a helicopter, for example, you need to take lessons. So, that is Unknown Armies. It's a very, very interesting system, and it's a fascinating game. There are many ideas in here which I find absolutely lovely, even if I don't personally quite get the game. I do know that there's a lot in here to love. But anyway, I've whittled on for quite long enough, so thank you very, very much for watching. But as always, most of all, you look after yourselves, and I'll catch you later. Bye now.